Okay, like I said before, name's Derek North, enrolled agent, Premier Account Executive, Continuing Education Director here at Federal Direct Tax Services and for users of preparetraining.com. And we're going to be going through the next in our Understanding the Principles of Individual Taxation uh, series, in which case we're talking about business expenses. In terms of uh, an outline, uh, we, we got one credit hour in general tax law topics category, and what we're going to actually talk about today is the treatment of various expenses and how they relate to business income, talk about the difference between business and personal expenses, including apportionment, and talk about certain special rules for uh, business expenses like meals and entertainment expenses and truck drivers. Uh, what this is not is a how-to or a walk-through of filing a return. Uh, discussion on a specific filing scenario for like an actual individual that you might be working on uh, due to disclosure requirements. I obviously can't discuss things like that unless we're speaking specifically in the general or how to file a business return. I also want to point out here that I'm not going to be running through in a master list of expenses and like well you can deduct this well you can deduct that because what you'll learn as you go through this is that there's actually a a series of conditions if you will um, for a, an expense to be deductible, which basically means that in the right circumstances, pretty much anything can be deductible, and there are very few in terms of the comparison to all the expenses that can possibly exist. There's actually very few types of expenses that don't, um, or that actually have like a specific rule set aside just for them. I also won't be going into as much detail over vehicle expenses because that is something that's going to be the focus of its own webinar due to the amount of complexity with it, although I will touch upon it briefly. So, that being said, uh, coming down for an overview, uh, what, is, what is a business expense? In order to be considered deductible, a uh, business expense has to be both ordinary and necessary. So even though, um, and, and by the way, even though something is ordinary and necessary, it doesn't always mean that it can be considered deductible. Um, so, and there are some examples of that. So capital expenses, uh, we'll cover that in a little bit. Costs that are going that are going to costs of goods sold. Personal expenses, uh, non-deductible portions of certain expenses, and expenses that are not allowable due to the accounting method chosen. Um, some some types of expenses get delayed until a future time. Some of them uh, basically have a portion that is just lost and you never get it back. And um, when I talk about deductible in the case of a business expense, I'm talking about something that is applying to a specific year to a specific economic activity. Um, so, like capital expenses are deductible through depreciation, for instance, uh, which we which we'll cover a little bit as well. An ordinary expense, when I talk about ordinary, ordinary expense is one that's considered common and accepted in the trade or industry that we're talking about. So in other words, it means it's usual. It represents something that's reasonable and frequent enough in the business. It doesn't mean that your outlandish expenses can't be taken. So you have something that is kind of unusual. It's just, generally speaking, there's got to be some relation to the business activity. Um, and a necessary expense is one that is helpful and appropriate. It doesn't mean necessary as in required, which is what most people think of when they actually think of the word necessary. Like, well, that means required, not in this case. It just means something that is helpful and appropriate to the business. So basically speaking, in simple terms, if the expense that the taxpayer has incurred helps them achieve the goals of their job and would be considered standard practice within the job, it can be considered to meet both conditions. So I have an example here to discuss that particular point. You have a freelance artist, and that freelance artist purchases a 3D modeling software program to help create art. That is completely normal. Uh, in anybody that's ever done any work with freelance artists or anybody that's working game design or anything, that's something that is quite often used, probably one of the primary programs that is used. It's ordinary and necessary. If that same software, on the other hand, is purchased by an insurance salesman, that is a very that is a much harder sell to the IRS if it ever gets questioned. Because the IRS will like run into and discuss, well, how in the world does a 3D modeling program help you sell insurance? Now, if you can substantiate that by you know, finding a way to make it appropriate if he actually is using it in his workflow and it is common enough uh, 
um, and helpful enough uh, in the business, then you would be able to justify it. But you, you gotta, that's where they're going at when they're talking about ordinary and necessary, is that it can't be something that's completely off the wall or more or less it cannot be something that is a disguised personal expense. Maybe the same insurance salesman likes to dabble with making art in his free time and wants to try to wrap it up under. And well, if he doesn't actually have a business purpose for it, then they can disallow that expense and basically take it off the return and he has some tax penalties as a result of it. Um, expenses generally also have to be something that doesn't last for a long time. And that's a really vague statement. And it's a really big statement because there is a discussion over what's called a capital expense, which is actually going to be a focus of the very next slide when we're talking about kind of expenses. So when I talk about kind of expenses, uh, these are not expenses in the technical, literal definition of the word. They do the same thing, though. They, they take away from income and they figure into the taxable, like, net profit of an economic activity, but they're treated differently because expenses have a specific slot. Like for instance, if you've ever done a Schedule C uh, or a Schedule CEZ, there is an expenses line or lines that factor in, but these expenses typically go elsewhere or are treated differently. So there are certain costs that you might consider expenses in an accounting or book sense of the word, but they're not treated as such in a tax sense. And one of those, like I said before, is a capital expense. A capital expense are the expenses that represent your assets, improvements to your assets, your startup costs, and things that are similar to that, and they have a usable life typically of a year or longer. So um, when you're talking about expenses, in a general sense, you buying, um, you know, buying paint to paint inside the house or, uh, or inside the office, like that right there would be an expense because it's not like the paint itself, like the, the jar of paint you bought is going to last like 25 years or something. Okay, so you, that, that'll be, that'd be a repair cost, for instance, that would be a deductible expense. But on the same token, if you expanded that, and that paint was also coupled with some drywall and some timber, and you've improved an asset, you added a room to an office, or you built a garage, or whatever, those types of things are an asset, which means that it has a much longer shelf life, and you have to capitalize those things. And capital expenses are deducted in a different way. They get carried down to the expense line on pretty much any one of these forms, but they are either handled through something called depreciation, amortization, or depletion. And that basically is taking the cost of something that is an asset and breaking it up into chunks and taking a little bit of it over time. Uh, so, and it can be quite a long time. For instance, residential rental property is depreciated over 27 and a half years, which is going to be 28 tax years that something on that property is taken off as an expense. So you don't get to deduct the whole cost of buying the building up front. You take a little bit of it over time. And uh, as well, speaking of, starting a new business is typically considered um, something that could incur an upfront cost. You get costs for you know, paying the accountants and the lawyers to do the paperwork and set up the uh, set up the bank accounts and negotiate the contracts and buy the equipment and things like that. Those types of things, those startup costs, typically are capitalized and they can't be entirely deducted in the same year. There is a little bit of startup and organizational costs that can be deducted, and I will cover. That's one of those few ones that actually does have an exception to the rule. But these types of expenses where uh, their justification is you are producing a business that could last the rest of your life. And so it has a longer shelf life. It's not just like buying bread to make sandwiches that will only last a week or, you know, buying a tool that you will end up breaking within a year. This is something that could last for a long time so it gets capitalized. So your, your assets, um, typically speaking, your real property, your equipment, uh, your, your improvements and renovations, they will pretty much always need to be capitalized. We're going to have an actual separate uh, webinar over depreciation since it is such a convoluted topic. Um, and I do want to point out as well is that there are certain ways that you can take assets and at least in some sense of the word expense them out and take the full value of them through things like special to bonus depreciation or section 179 elections and tangible property rules as well that we will cover towards the end which the IRS finalized over the last uh, over the last year it basically uh, went into effect in 2015 uh, signed into law in late 2014 
And um, when we're talking about these types of things as well, if you don't know anything about depreciation, most of the limits on depreciation, like a, a, a cap on the amount that you can depreciate, for instance, um, those types of things are primarily hinged upon the taxpayer's AGI. And the AGI uh, impact, for instance, on a Section 179 election is $250,000 a year. So a taxpayer start, or buying assets in the year can Section 179, generally speaking, $250,000 of it a year and expense it off. So most of the limitations are not going to apply to most of your clients unless you have some big money clients that are coming in, in which case they're probably already aware of this because they've made their purchase decisions in line with tax planning strategies over things like this. Uh, when we talk about depreciation, that is the cost recovery for mostly tangible property like machines, buildings, vehicles, equipment. Um, amortization is going to be the cost recovery method for mostly in intangible assets, as in they're not physically in existence, like business goodwill. You buy a business and there's a value associated with that business for the existing client base and your reputation. So you, know, so you buy a business from a, a guy, maybe you buy a pizza shop, and he is a beloved pizza shop owner in this town, and he says, well, my client base is worth $50,000. You're going to amortize that that particular amount of, uh, of goodwill. Those types of things that are intangible get amortized. Amortization is pretty much straight line, as in the cost gets, gets broken up equally every single year down the line. Depreciation as many different ways. There are some of them that are faster, some of them that are slower, some of them that have to be used. Um, that's the reason why it's going to be its own webinar. And depletion is the final one, which is not going to be as common. That is a cost recovery method for various types of natural resources like timber, coal, gas, oil, gems, and so on. Um, since your capital expenses are partially recovered over that time frame, there will be a discrepancy between your book and tax balance. So if you're looking at the, the top of the line and your clients have given you a profit and loss and they spent $50,000 buying new equipment, that doesn't mean, generally speaking, unless they're taking those Section 179s or they're taking those special bonus depreciations for qualifying property, that doesn't mean that they're going to get to take $50,000 off the income they're going to get taxed over. So you want to keep that in mind is that there will be a discrepancy unless they happen to make those elections or can uh, expense some of those things out. Another one that gets wrapped up into this that um, essentially affects the tax return in the same way in, in that it reduces your income is COGS or your cost of goods sold. That's another kind of expense and that applies to businesses that produce or purchase goods for resale. They make stuff and sell it or they buy stuff and sell it or some combination of the above. And essentially for businesses that have COGS, what they need to do is value their inventory at the beginning and end of the year and include certain costs that are directly related to that. So the raw materials, freight and shipping, storage costs, the direct labor, including contributions to the pension and annuity plans for the workers who actually make the product or move the product around. So if you had a warehouse, for instance, you would include the cost of the guys that are running around uh, in the back, uh, you know, moving product around and storing it and carrying it and purchasing it and, and everything else like that. You would include that in COGS, but you wouldn't, for instance, include that uh, the, the wage cost for your cashiers that might be in another store across town that's actually selling the final goods. And then there's a cost of overhead. Any cost that's directly connected to the production or purchasing of the goods for resale get factored into COGS. And the way that that typically comes down is that your COGS is going to be the beginning of the year inventory plus all the costs, and then you take away the value of whatever the end of year inventory is. So I start a new business, I have no inventory, I spend $100,000 buying stuff and paying people and storing stuff, and at the end of the year I still have $15,000 worth of merchandise in my warehouse, I'm going to basically take that $15,000 out of my COGS and I'm going to have an $85,000 cost of goods sold figure that's going to count against my profit. Um, they count in the full way that regular expenses do, but the big difference is, is that they factor directly into gross income calculation and not net profit. And that is important because if you look at your Schedule C, the income section has a cost of goods sold, and instead of 
the gross profit having expenses taken away from it to arrive at net, it is factored into the top level gross, which changes the way some credits and some various types of uh, some various types of tax calculations which rely on one or the other number are used. It is possible as well that businesses might be required to capitalize their cost of goods sold through what's called a uniform capitalization rule or unicap if they have average gross receipts of 10 million or more for the preceding three tax years. And that's something we're not going to cover because that could be its own multi-hour webinar. But generally speaking, if you have a large business that has COGS, it's possible that they'll have to capitalize that. They'll have to take their COGS and basically turn that into a capital asset that they then depreciate over time because there is an intrinsic value to the amount of inventory that they have for a business of that size. Um, speaking of, uh, I did have a question I feel is appropriate that popped up talking about time frames for amortization. Uh, amortization time frames are going to be different depending upon the intangible asset class, but generally speaking, most of your, uh, most of your amortization takes place over a five-year period. Um, another kind of expense is a personal expense. As a rule, uh, if you've been uh, on abreast of these webinars or been doing taxes for a while, you know that personal expenses are non-deductible, at least against uh, you know income from economic activities. There are certain personal expenses that you can itemize, like your like your mortgage interest and stuff that go on your Schedule A. But in terms of running a business, you're not going to be able to take like your groceries, for instance, into your business expenses. Um, there are expenses, however, that are a mix between personal and business use, and those can be considered deductible as long as the business use is apportioned properly and the most common example of this is the business use of home. That right there is an assignment of a percentage of your personal expenses and direct expenses connected to using your home that counts against it. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later because um, I, I do actually have a couple slides specifically about business use of home because it is uh, such an important topic. And then there are Finally, as a kind of expenses, there are just flat-out non-deductible expenses. Um, so, for instance, meal and entertainment expenses in most circumstances are deducted at only 50% of their value. So, if you have meal and entertainment expenses during the year of $1,000, you take 500 of it on the return itself, and the remainder of it's just lost. It's just a limitation. That right there is an example of an expense that you just don't get any uh, that you have, but it doesn't actually have any tax effect. And that's because even even if it is for business purposes, like if you bought you know meals for instance on your own while you're while you're working um, and you're eating, you're still deriving at least some personal benefit, even if like having those expenses are connected to it. And there are different ways that you can have more or less. Um, there are different ways you can have more or less of the fifty percent, but generally speaking, fifty percent. And there are some expenses that are limited like that. How much to deduct is another really important question, and the general answer to that is that they can deduct the full amount of the business expense if it's not personal or capital expense. So unless there is a specific limitation because of a type of income, or they're forced to capitalize it or treat it differently by statute, uh, they can take the cost of the uh, the cost of it uh, of, of it off the top. It's also subject to what's called the tax benefit rule. So the tax benefit rule basically says if you pay an expense and you get part or all of it back in the same tax year for the same expense, you just simply reduce the amount of the expense. I spend a whole bunch of money on supplies during the year, and then in November I get a rebate of 100 bucks. So I would just simply reduce the amount of my initial invoice by 100 bucks, and that would be what I would factor into my supply cost during the year. However, the tax benefit uh, rule takes effect if the recovery takes place in a year after. So basically, I buy my supplies during the year and I don't get that rebate, and I don't even get that rebate or even get the option for it until the next year. They review my account and go, oh, hey, you're part of our members program. Let's give you some extra money. Well, what I have at that point is not a requirement to amend last year's return and drop my supply cost. I just take the tax benefit that I received in a prior year and I put it as income on the current year. So there actually is other income section on most of these economic activities that you can actually separately line out income like this. And you include that in your income to the to the extent that the original deduction for the expense affected your tax liability. So if I had an expense, for instance, that did not actually affect my tax, maybe the maybe the expense was non-deductible because it was I had at-risk limitations or something of that nature, and I get some of that refund or some of that money that I originally claimed back, unless I'm getting a tax benefit from it, I don't have to worry about it. 
but uh, the discrepancy happens to come from cross tax years, cross tax years. Um, loss limitations uh, do factor into this. Um, most of the time, though, your loss limitations are not going to be a really big issue. This is something that tends to apply to higher AGI taxpayers. Um, income that exceed or expenses that exceed income generate losses. Losses can be restricted. Um, if the activity itself is not for profit or there is a, either no profit motive or no profit presumption or the IRS changes its mind and reclassifies it as a non-profit or, or uh, operation, then your expenses that go at a loss cannot be used to offset taxable income in other categories. Basically, if something's not for profit, the expenses can only apply to the income derived and nothing further. The rest of it is usually lost or in some cases maybe even carried forward into future years where there is actually a profit. It. And then there's also at-risk rules that determine the level of risk that they have in any economic activity. And the at-risk rules actually get thrown on a form called a 6198. If you're doing a Schedule C in the software we use, for instance, there's a checkbox if you're running at a loss that goes, hey, is this taxpayer all at risk or maybe partially not at risk? Now, the rules for what determine your level of at-risk essentially are outlined in the publication I drew most of this stuff from, which is Pub 535, and there's a couple of other places that we have in the resources section that actually talk about it too, but long story short, um, if your taxpayer is personally liable for like the expenses and like if they spend the money, it's going to hurt them. Uh, usually that's going to be considered at risk. Your, your at risk rules are usually going to be equal to the basis of your investment in the property. And that actually does actually factor in to be a fairly important facet of the tax rule, um, or of the tax law, because it's actually one of the few ways that has been determined by the Supreme Court um, that the uh, government cannot tax income. They can't tax income until you've recouped your investment in something. Um, that's uh, the the recovery of uh, capital doctrine, actually. That being said, unless your client's got some kind of like weird insurance policy or a whole bunch of loans that like he can that he'll never have to pay for some reason, generally they're usually going to be considered at risk for everything. Um, passive activity losses. If you have an activity uh, that you're generating for profit, but it's passive, a good example for this would be uh, rental real estate. Uh, that you have expenses associated with. Your passive activity losses typically only count against your passive activity income, which includes your trades or bit, and, and that also includes trades or businesses, in which case the taxpayer does not, not materially participate. Maybe you have a client who is a sole proprietor running the restaurant, and he runs it in name only, like the actual bulk of material participation and everything else is really handled by others, and he's just throwing money at it on the side. That right there would be an example of some t uh, of mater material participation which is lacking on the taxpayer side. So if suddenly he goes belly up one year, he's going to usually be capped at the amount that he can take because his level of risk and material participation uh, don't actually justify him offsetting other income from other activities. There's also the possibility that losses drop the overall top level return income below the certain limits and generates a net operating loss. And net operating losses can actually um, that might actually be limiting the amount of deductions you can take because that loss gets ported around from year to year. It goes back a couple years, gets carried forward a few years, depending upon the elections the taxpayer takes and uh, other event-based filing scenarios. So something to keep in mind as well is that some of your losses might be limited by any one or a number of these things. You have like a really bad year, just generates this huge loss, and he's got an actual top-level net operating loss. Well, some of those deductions, for instance, are just going to get basically chopped up and carried around to other years. Uh, next is when to deduct. And when to, the when to deduct is actually based on a taxpayer's accounting method. And an accounting method is the rule system that is used to determine the time frame that you report income and expenses. The vast majority of taxpayers use the cash method, which means when I get money or when I'm constructively receiving this money, I report it. And when I get expenses and I pay them, they get taken out of it. Um, and the next most common one is an accrual method or a hybrid method of one of those two, like those three. There are a few other types of accounting methods that are usually limited to specific industries, like some of the year digits and things like that, that you probably never have to worry about unless you're actually a CPA or you're working with like oil drilling companies that are probably going to be in the multi-millions a year in profit or film studios and things like that. Really weird stuff in the tax law. It doesn't apply to 99% of the taxpayers that are going to walk in your door.
or even more than that, even like 99.999%. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen any other accounting method, for instance, on any of the thousands of returns I've looked at that was anything different than cash, accrual, or hybrid. And um, if you've never heard of uh, accounting methods before, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. I will talk about how it relates to the expenses, though, and that is in the cash method, your expenses are deducted when they're paid, essentially. You pay it, you deduct it uh, in that tax year, and that's pretty much how it works. Under accrual uh, method, it is a more expansive process in that accrual method taxpayers, and to give a little bit of background, accrual method basically reports income and expenses when there's a fixed liability to it, not when they necessarily actually receive it. So on an accrual basis taxpayer, which is going to be usually people that have um, um, usually people that have, for instance, inventory, um, you, you get an order comes in December and says, well, I'm going to order 100 chairs from your factory. You would report that as income because a contractual obligation now exists that says, I'm going to get money from this taxpayer for these products. Okay, and it's similar to how the expenses are deducted in this and that they have to pass a test to essentially determine that the liability was established. The first one is called the all events test, in which case the expense is considered to have been passed or the test is uh, considered to have been passed when the event has occurred that determines or fixes a liability. So here is proof that you owe me money. That, that right there is what they're talking about. And number two, that the liability can be determined with a reasonable degree of accuracy. So not only do you owe me money, you owe me X dollars of money. That becomes the all events test that says, okay, we know that we have to pay it. Here's an expense and we know how much it has to be there we go, that's the first one. And the next one is the economic performance test, which is that services and or products have been provided and or used by one or another uh, parties in the arrangement. So if you do have, like for instance, an, a liability that is contingent upon goods or services being performed, it's the actual performance of the, of the service that determines that that has happened. Because someone can say, yeah, well, uh, you're gonna, you owe me in, uh, in the payment of sending your guys over here to fix up my network. Well, until those guys go fix the network, it's just hypothetical. No service has been rendered, no value has been assigned. So even though we can say, oh, it, we determined on X date that we need to actually do this and here's the amount of the value, until it actually happens, it's just hypothesis. It's just floating around in, in imagination land. There's also a few different other limitations to keep in mind. One of them is prepayment limitations. It doesn't really matter what method of accounting. If you prepay for multiple years in advance, they only apply for the year in which, they, uh, in which it actually applies to. And that exists to prevent taxpayers from prepaying liabilities and creating an asset that is deducted instead of capitalized. So I get a lease and I pay the entire lease for three years. Well, even though I spent you know, X thousands of dollars for that first year, I'm only gonna be able to deduct the part that applies to each specific tax year, because any number of things can happen between now and then that can prevent that from actually coming to fruition. And what they don't wanna do is have people pay a whole bunch of money and deduct something that essentially becomes an asset. So if I paid like three years worth of uh, lease payments up front, I've essentially created an asset that I'm bypassing the capitalization rules on. Um, and taking a look at something, uh, by the way, uh, there, there, okay, I see a few questions that are related to the production of income, and I will handle those towards the end. So uh, continuing onward, um, so I, I can see the person just typed the question, don't worry, we'll get that covered. Um, talk about some of those net operating losses and uh, income production later as well. But uh, contested liability, if for whatever reason the liability is contested by one or more parties, it only actually exists if all the other conditions are satisfied in uh, the year that the liability is actually paid or the claim to the contest is actually settled. Um, otherwise, it just kind of doesn't exist. And then related persons, they have a special rule under accrual um, that actually has to be paid. So that way you can't just claim that you are going to pay your cousin for X service and never actually pay it. Um, it actually has to be paid and reported as income by the other person to be deductible. So that way you can't use your family and like close relationships with friends and stuff to essentially bypass the tax code. Um, Not-for-profit activity, we're about a halfway point. I'm going to go ahead and launch the first polling question, or the only polling question really that exists in this. This is strictly for attendance. If you're attending this webinar in a uh, 
uh, after a recording instead of a live presentation, you don't need to frantically click your screen. You'll take an examination at the end. And the question is, how often do your clients um, basically uh, try to claim bogus, uh, bogus expenses? So for right now, uh, we've just got three answers, frequently, occasionally, or never slash first tax season. Um, I probably am going to imagine that most of this is going to be in the occasionally category, just simply due to the fact that there's just a wide range of stuff that people don't know, and you know they think that it's related. I'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff as it pops up, because we are going to be going through a couple of different example expenses um, and how they and how they factor into it. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, I see. I saw someone ask, uh, "What about giving uh, like sporting tickets as prizes? If um, whether that's considered deductible?" Well, you got to ask yourself this question: Is it ordinary and necessary for whatever business uh, activity the client is engaged in uh, for that type of expense to be incurred? Well, if you are interacting with the public and it's you know part of customer retention to get them drawn into the door. Uh, yeah, like prizes that you award out to the public are perfectly fine, unless it's like really uncommon or it's an attempt to bypass like related party rules or fraudulent in some nature or doesn't align with state, local, or federal law, then typically like awarding prizes to get people into the door, especially for customer services, is perfectly fine. It uh, looks like most everybody has voted. I'm going to leave this up for about another 15 seconds for the 10 or 15% of people out there who haven't clicked any buttons. If you don't click any buttons or you're on your phone or something or you're attending this on the phone sense, uh, by all means, please uh, please find a way to let us know that you attended. I do know a couple people that are doing this uh, on the road currently that uh, I'm going to be touching base with to make sure that, that their participation is logged. Okay, I'm going to keep this up for about another five, four, Three, two, one, close and share the results. And as you can see, we got about half of the audience saying occasionally, about 40% said never um, or first tax season. Uh, especially if you're doing low income neighborhoods and you don't really have a lot of people who are running their own businesses, this might obviously not happen. Um, and then about 10% of you said frequently. So uh, not, not too surprised, pretty much falls in line with about what I expected. Moving on, not-for-profit activity. Uh, this is important because the IRS can determine presumption of profit. Generally speaking, your business activity is going to be conducted under a presumption of profit, which basically means that they intend to generate income from the activity in a business-like manner. Uh, activities that are not conducted for profit are limited in that their expenses typically can't exceed the income generated and it can't offset other taxable income and in a lot of cases those expenses are considered hobby expenses and those are itemized deductions if you're talking about hobby expenses itemized deductions that are limited um, in the sense that they are itemized subject to a AGI limitation and can only go to the extent of the income derived so there isn't a dollar for dollar consideration for that and the IRS finds this very important because they don't want Want people to constantly be throwing money into something just as an excuse to lower their tax bill um, because there might be more of an impact from having these expenses and the personal usage derived from it, um, it you know if they're treating it as a business when they shouldn't and the IRS can revoke uh, income and expenses from being treated as business like if they determine that there isn't a profit motive and the benchmark they use for that is profit in three out of five tax years or for some reason two out of seven if the business happens to involve horses in some sense and if there are exigent circumstances that can pop up that dictate exceptions to this on a case-by-case -case basis there's also a form called a 5213 and that 5213 basically says hey I'm starting a new business or I'm engaging in this activity I don't want any of your people looking at my business and trying to argue whether or not it's real until the deadline and if they file that within the first three years of starting the activity, then the IRS essentially assesses a determination at the end of the time period that determines whether or not it's considered for profit and then it goes from there. And that helps prevent people who might be operating close to their margins. Um, I've never really seen anybody actually do this, but it does exist as an opportunity for people out there to essentially keep their clients from having inquiries into their profit motivation. Um, it's like, like a good faith estimate of presumption of profit. And those exigent circumstances, by the way, even if you're not profitable um, in this business activity in three out of the five years, you can still bypass the test if, when the IRS looks, they find some 
uh, circumstances that indicate, for instance, that you are operating it like a business, and those include but are not limited to carrying on the activity in a business-like manner, having a large amount of time and effort placed into operating that business activity, dependence on that activity for one's livelihood, or adaptability in your operating strategies to generate more profit or mitigate your losses by responding to the market and so on. If it's obvious that the person is attempting to make a profit, even if they're just not good at it, um, those usually can bypass those restrictions. Because in a lot of cases, those expenses just carry forward when they're not used um, and you know, generate that tax benefit, that potential net operating loss, uh, and so on to future years to help offset profit as it comes along. Uh, talking about some example expenses, um, I told you I wasn't going to run through all the expenses that exist, and I wasn't joking because uh, we could we literally can never cover it. I'm sure each person could give me an hour's worth of things that they wonder about whether or not they'd be considered deductible. Ordinary and necessary, those are the big things. But there are some things that are treated a little bit differently. Um, one of the things that has its own chapter in the Pub 535, for instance, is taxpayer um, or employer expenses to pay their employees. And taxpayers, when they do have employees, they can deduct the full value of that employee pay, whether it's salary and wages, whether it's goods and services that they provide at their fair market value, bonuses, fringe benefits, uh, awards offered to their employees, and so on. Um, paying for employee meals um, typically is going to be limited to 50% unless they're included in the wages or they're considered a de minimis fringe benefit, among other reasons. Like there's an actual full list in there, for instance, that shows you different ways that you can take 100% of the employee expenses. Like if a, if a boss, for instance, is buying meals because his uh, employees are sitting in an office chair for 12 hours a day, uh, for instance, that right there, something that'd probably be able to be considered 100% because he's doing it for his convenience. He's not doing it to like bypass like the wage reporting laws or taxability of it to his taxpayers. It's de minimis. It would be a hassle for him to account for that. Um, you know, there are things like that where you can actually get more than that, but generally speaking, your employee meals are going to be 50% unless they fit one of those categories. And then there's also employee awards. And there's tons of different categories of awards. I'm not going to run through them. There's like five or six of them. And there's different amounts that you can basically deduct and different amounts that the employees either do or do not include in their wages. Like I said, Pub 535, if you go to the end where you have the resources, there's a clickable link. Or if you look at Publication 535, the whole document itself is about 53 pages long um, as of tax year 2015. Uh, some other uh, expenses consideration, rent and lease payments. Uh, increases uh, or increases to tax liability, they're shifted to the lessee. Uh, so like, you know, maybe the taxpayer uh, has is leasing a place and suddenly they're like, hey, um, I'm going to increase your rent because the property tax is hiked up. Any of these types of things, those can usually be deducted when appropriate to their accounting method. And I only bring this up um, specifically because I talk about prepaid rent. Prepaid rent, I mentioned it earlier in my example, it's a common one that people attempt to do. Te prepaid rent can only be deducted in the tax year to which it applies. Uh, even, if, even if all the other tests are satisfied, uh, say you're going to be using it and whatever, you're, it, it essentially creates an asset if you prepay a whole bunch of rent in advance but bypasses the capitalization rules in most cases. Um, so it only applies to the year. So I pay for three years. I'm going to take that and split it up and equally divide it up amongst the years into which it applies. Um, rents and leases can also be subject to unicap rules because that is overhead that is factored into producing your goods and services. So for those taxpayers that have $10, 10 million or more in gross receipts over three years that are subject to unicap might have to possibly drop their rent and leases into those unicap rules. Um, taxes by themselves. Uh, taxes can generally only be deducted in the year that they're paid regardless of accounting method. So regardless of whether or not you're accrual or your cash basis, your uh, taxes are going to be pretty much only deductible for the tax year that they're paid. So even if you are living in a jurisdiction where they assess things uh, pre, um, you know, pre year, they, like they do their property tax assessments for next year in the middle of the year before and so on. Whenever you actually take the money out of your account and drop it into the, you know, put it on check or drop it into the state coffers is when it's going to actually be prepared or, or uh, deductible. And taxes also have to be directly related to the business. And why I'm bringing this up is because if you have employees and you're withholding money from their paychecks, for their taxes, 
you get to deduct your portion as the employer that represents your half of the FICA taxes. You get to deduct your uh, FUDA taxes for your unemployment tax. You get to deduct the state taxes that you got to pay on it, your sales tax that you pay on your goods and stuff. But what you're not going to do is take the amount of income tax that maybe you're paying in estimated tax payments and drop it on your Schedule C to help offset it because it's going to be double dipping. Because those go on the 1040 you know, on the second page, you can't basically put it in two places. So it's got to be directly related to the business. If it's personal in nature, then it's if it's deductible, it's going to be an itemizable expense on the Schedule A. And if it's related to the business, it goes on it. And if it's mixed, you're going to apportion it out. And that's really important when you're doing business use of home. I'll cover that a little bit more in one of the upcoming slides. But taxes have to be related to business. Your personal, individual level, non-related to your business activity taxes do not go anywhere on your, on your Schedule Cs, your Schedule Es, your Schedule Fs. Your insurance that you pay for various reasons is typically deductible. I think there's 13 explicitly defined categories, uh, like yeah, like 11 or 13 or something like that, defined categories inside the 535 talking about premiums you can pay and whether it's deductible. Um, usually it's going to be deductible except for certain types of life insurance policies, self-insurance reserve funds, and some types of insurance that cover lost earnings because of sickness and or disability. Essentially what they're trying to do is prevent taxpayers from paying premiums uh, and deducting them for policies that they are going to get a benefit from. So if you know I have a, a policy on uh, my employees or whatever to cover lost earnings because they're sick and are disabled and I suddenly say, oh well, you know, John Doe here, he's sick, here's the lost earnings from my business and then, you know, collect a check from the insurance company, like obviously there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. Now there's various ways that you can actually factor that into overhead, like I said before, there are some defined categories. But um, if the person who was running the business stands to personally benefit uh, from it and it's not to actually cover like a catastrophe or something that insurance actually goes over, then usually, um, usually that self-benefit is going to be non-deductible premiums. I did talk about startup costs being capitalized. Um, there is an exception to that, and it's basically anything. I think the deadline is uh, anything after October 22nd of 2004 my memory serves, up to $5,000 of your startup costs and $5,000 of your organizational costs can be deducted. And the rest of it just gets amortized over a five-year period. And on the Schedule C, for instance, that's going to be your other expenses on the bottom of page two. Um, that is limited, however. If you, if you hit $50,000, every amount, that, every dollar that you go up over that $50,000 will reduce it, so as an inverse ratio. So once you have $100,000 of startup and organizational costs, you can't actually deduct and amortize it. It's going to have to be uh, capitalized, generally speaking. Um, and when you talk about startup costs and organizational costs, what I'm talking about is startup costs are like you know getting the business started, buying the equipment, um, investigating your markets, preparing reports, and things like that. Your organizational costs are going to be like the accountancy to set up the actual bank accounts, uh, talking to the lawyer to do the paperwork, and things like that. So for most people, your startup and organizational costs you can take ten thousand dollars, five for each. The rest of it gets amortized equally on a straight line over a five-year period. Employers that pay out per diem amounts or cover their employees' costs for things like meals and travel generally can take the full deduction if those expenses are covered under an accountable plan. And when we talk about an accountable plan, the IR, an accountable plan is when an employer pays for the expenses and the employee doesn't include it in his income because if he paid it out of his pocket, then he would be deducting them on his own return. And the IRS doesn't want to get into the nitty gritty of going into the who paid, who paid, who paid kind of thing. So an accountable plan basically exists and says that the taxpayer's employer is going to exist by proxy and is just going to deduct them. He's paying them, so you don't need to report it on the taxpayer's return, deduct them from wages, and then the employee themselves deducts them on their own return, possibly subject to limitations. No, no, no. Throw all out the window, an accountable plan says, you have expenses, you tell me what those expenses are, I will pay for them. I will reimburse you, and as long as that happens, then it's just a business expense for the boss, the employee has no benefit. If the plan is not accountable, and it's just sort of flying all around, you know, he's like, hey, here's $100, and then that employee may or may not 
actually spend all that or maybe he spends even more out of it than those are supposed to go in his wages. So the employer does get to deduct him his wages, but then those same amounts are going to be subject to withholding rules. So for every amount on a non-accountable plan, the employer is going to be paying his portion of Social Security and Medicare. He's going to be paying his food. He's going to be paying his state level taxes and withholding and so on. And the employee is going to have to deduct and substantiate those costs, potentially subject to limitations. Uh, meals and entertainment expenses are usually 50%. The remainder is lost, non-deductible. Some meals can be taken at 100%, um, like providing, you know, like if you are providing like a potluck dinner to like clientele uh, that are coming or like, you know, the clients coming off the street or something, you know, that'd be the same as you like having material cost for making the food and stuff like that, certain other conditions. Um, Certain transportation workers who are subject to the hours of service limitations from the Department of Transportation can do 80% of the meal and incidental rates. And the people who are subject to those rules also get access to the uh, federal government's uh, standard allowances. So instead of them actually going through the various IRS publications and figuring out how long they were in various parts of the country for various times of the year, they can just say, well, I spent 100 days on the road. I'm going to take X number of dollars. I know for truck drivers, for instance, the per diem rate um, for over-the-road travel is $62 a day that they have. And then they would multiply whatever their total daily amount is by 80%, and that would be the, their deduction amount, at whether they're doing it on a 2106 or the Schedule C. Uh, vehicle expenses, uh, they are important and complex enough that they will have their own webinar, but briefly, you can use the actual expense method, which is the real cost that you paid, plus the depreciation of the vehicle, or the standard mileage rate, as long as they use five or less cars. Once you get more than that, then you start talking about fleet operations, then you have to use actual expense method no matter what. They're a lot more complicated than this. I did say there was going to be a separate webinar, and the biggest differences is that there are maximums to the amount of depreciation dependent upon whether or not the vehicle is considered luxury vehicle or not, whether or not it's subject to Internal Revenue Code Section 280F restrictions, yada, yada, yada. Um, Standard mileage rate for business use, by the way, for tax year 2016 is 54 cents a mile, dropped from 57 and a half cents. And if you are using mixed use, like you have a personal vehicle that you occasionally use for business, it is apportioned on mileage ratios, whatever the total business miles are to the total miles in general for that particular tax year. Uh, some other example expenses, uh, anything that is in violation of a federal, state, or local law can't be deducted. I don't think that that really requires a lot of explanation, but a good example is a kickback. It might be ordinary and necessary for you to do that, but it might be illegal. So, you know, maybe you're doing a kickback to another company, and in the real, the real world, the reality of the situation is you'd never be able to do business unless you did that. You still don't get to deduct them because if that's illegal where you are or violates you know, the rules in some sense or another, then you can't claim it. And that actually is an explicitly defined example because there are several businesses that do exist on a you know, shoulder bump, elbow bump, nudge, nudge system where people do kickbacks and stuff like that. But unfortunately, they don't get any benefit from the fact that they might have to fork over 10% of their income for these types of arrangements. Um, penalties, fines, and fees are usually deductible unless they're connected to government or instrumentality charges and violation. Instrumentality is just a, a generic word for another tax jurisdiction, like a city, a county, a local ordinance, whatever. If you're getting charged by the government for something you're doing wrong, you can't deduct that. But if you have a penalty on a contract, for instance, that you broke, and nothing's legal about it, you just maybe you couldn't satisfy the, con the contract's conditions, like that's a deductible expense because it's a cost that you incurred. Uh, repairs are deductible. I do want to be careful to distinguish that they should be capitalized. Capitalizing something basically is, you know, whether or not it's going to have a long shelf life is really your litmus test. But slapping a new coat of paint on the wall, that should, that's fine. That's a repair. Um, replacing the light switches in a room, okay, that's fine. That's a repair. Fixing a broken window, repair. Getting an entirely new driveway, adding a new room, replacing the roof putting a fence up, those types of things are capitalized because unless you have the worst contractors in the world and can literally not expect these repairs or these changes to last, um, you know, less than a year, then it's going to need to be capitalized. Um, as we're starting to wind up and get close to the time, I do have a section for business use of home. The Form 8829 is used to determine what percentage of expenses are considered for business use. Uh, generally speaking, expenses are apportioned based on the area used exclusively for business purposes compared to the total area of the property. Um, if you have an office in your home, 
Technically speaking, it has to be used exclusively for business purposes to be considered deductible. If you have a room in your house where you occasionally take the computer to do tax returns, it doesn't make it exclusive if the rest of the time your kids are playing in it or you might have like company sleeping in that bedroom um, over the time frame. Uh, daycare providers are a little bit different because daycare providers might use most or all of their house, in which case they use the percentage of their home multiplied by the percent of day. A lot of daycare providers will have kids over at their house for 10 to 12 hours, so they'll multiply it by the area used for their home, which might be the whole home, and uh, you know that right there helps them possibly get more, but it might even limit them comparatively. Uh, direct expenses that are co connected to the business that have no personal uses whatsoever are taken in full. So in our example, we have an office connected to the house, and I manually have an office that I install like a dedicated business internet line for. Like I don't get to use it in the rest of the house. It doesn't go to my TV. It's strictly business use. That's a direct expense. You take that in full. Everything else gets prorated to the ratio. So if I use 10% of my house, in this calculation, I use 10% of my personal business expenses in connection to it. And you apportion those out, and anything that could be itemized would get prorated out and then carried over to the Schedule A. So if I'm using 10% of my house, I get to take 10% of my mortgage interest, 10% of my property taxes, uh, and so on and so on as a business expense, and then the remaining 90% gets carried over, and if I get to itemize, then, that's, then, the, then it's going to be limited and go there. I will say that it is subject to intense scrutiny because it is easily abused, and that's why they invented the safe harbor method. The safe harbor method is $5 per square foot, up to 300 square foot for a maximum of $1,500. You do the safe harbor method, they won't question it. They just accept it and move on. And there's no, and once, if you do the safe harbor method, you don't need to prorate anything. So even if I have a 300 square foot or exclusive office in my 1,500 square foot home, I don't need to apportion my mortgage and my utilities and everything else as long as I'm using the safe harbor method. I can just take those in full on the Schedule A and just move on. Uh, tangible property regs are something that's important. Uh, basically, the IRS realized that, like, technically speaking, a guy going out and buying a $200 nail gun should depreciate it. But who seriously wants to go through the trouble of adding a 4562 and then taking off a $200 nail gun piece by piece for six years? Okay, like, who who really wants to do that? Um, so they have a rule in place for the tangible property regs, and basically for each of your tangible, as in physically existing assets, invoice, or an item on an invoice that you can determine, you can just expense out without any other justification other than the receipt, $2,500 following the de minimis safe harbor thresholds that are outlined in Treasury Regulation uh, 1.263A 1F12, blah, blah, blah. The long and short of it is if you have something that you bought, you don't want to go through in Section 179, depreciate it, whatever. You can expense it out using these regulations, $2,500 an item, okay? And if you can definitively prove each item is separate, then you can do that multiple times and potentially not depreciate anything. And there, in, in our software, at least, you can actually add an election form and say, you know, expensing out assets due to Treasury regulations, yada, yada. There's actual verbiage that goes with it. Taxpayers that have an applicable financial statement, meaning they took their budget to a certified public, um, certified public accountant or something like that and had an applicable financial statement generated, um, you can usually expense up to $5,000 per item instead. And now an applicable financial statement might cost $5,000 to do, so this is something that's not going to happen unless your guy has got you know, dozens and dozens of very large items that he wants to expense out, in which case they will give an amount that he can deduct and then the remainder would need to be depreciated according to its, its time scale. The IRS is also audit, are offering audit relief by not challenging amounts that were deducted under these rules prior to tax year 2016. Um, because this has been in play as a potential reality since 2013, so people were doing things like this, and the IRS has basically said, if you did this in the past, we're not going to do, do a backtrack audit and say, oh, gotcha, uh, they're not going to do an ex post facto um, you know, judgment against a taxpayer because of something that occurred after the fact. Um, there are some limited exceptions to it, so if you feel free to take a look at Treasury Reg 1.263 um, and take a look at it or just look up tangible property regs or repair regulations, etc. But it helps keep people from necessarily having to capitalize and like account for small purchases in, in essentially an annoying fashion. Um, 
forms to use. Typically speaking, your expenses are going to go on the same schedule if it's specific to the economic activity. Schedule C for your sole props and your independent contractors. Schedule E for your rental and royalty activity. Schedule F for your farming and fishing. If it's connected to the person's performance as an employee, it's a Form 2106 that carries to the Schedule A line 21, which means that it is an itemized deduction, which means it is limited, which means it is not dollar for dollar. But if you are an employee of another and you have business expenses, all these rules apply. It just goes on a different form. It doesn't have quite the same punch as if they were uh, you know, self-employed. If it's connected to an organization outside the individual, then most of those are going to go on the business return. Your 1065 partnerships, your 1120 corps, your 1120 subchapter S corps, your 990 series nonprofits, 1041 fiduciaries, estates and trusts, etc. And then anything that is separately deductible might be separately stated on the K1s that are generated and then reported there. Uh, but basically, what they're trying to, what I'm trying to get at is that the forms. And the expenses and the economic activity, they want to compartmentalize it, uh, and it stays on that form. So on your 1040, you're going to have the total sole proprietorship self-employment figure for a plus or a minus. You're not going to have a stapled statement on the 1040 that shows a list of your expenses. That goes on the Schedule C. The total is carried to the 1040 because the 1040 is like a, an index of sorts for your economic activity for the year. Some final thoughts. Uh, expenses must be connected to the business activity uh, or income production of some capacity. Can't be personal. So no Schedule C losses for buying your kids groceries. Yes, I have seen that attempted. Um, keep record keeping in the back of your mind as a preparer. I do actually have another webinar that we did earlier this year over record keeping. In a worst case scenario, have them complete a reconstruction of income and expenses. Provide a profit or loss statement for your records. Have them sign off on it. So in a worst case scenario, they can't point to finger at you and say, oh, well, he just made these numbers up. Um, by the way, don't use an economic schedule as a way to bypass itemizing employee expenses. Don't say, well, my client doesn't have enough expenses to itemize, but I really want to take these costs out of pocket for his boss, so I'm going to drop it on a Schedule C with no income and do that. Like That's technically tax fraud, and they could really, really hit you hard on that one. Um, depreciation of assets lowers their basis, so when you are, um, as does deducting the costs if the item is expensed, so what that means is it generates a larger capital uh, gain when it's disposed of, so if I am taking away from the cost of the item and I sell it later, I'm going to have more income to report because I don't have a larger investment to count against that profit. Uh, your standard mileage rates, by the way, also include an intrinsic depreciation figure. So vehicles that are being used for business purposes, regardless of whether you're using actual expenses or the standard mileage rate, will always depreciate as they are used for business, no matter which method you choose. That was $0.24 cents a mile in 2015. Um, I also want to say if you have the opportunity, try to push taxpayers to separate their personal and business finances in some sense, even if that means just having them take one night out of a month to like write on a spreadsheet or a piece of paper what's actually going to their business to make it a little bit easier on you. If they use an accounting software and can generate a profit and loss, it is so much easier to do that. If I get a profit and loss from someone's QuickBooks for their little partnership, I can usually knock out most of the meat of a partnership return, for instance, in a couple of hours as opposed to weeks of back and forth with the individual and reconstruction on my own from various receipts. Uh, by the way, another thing, speaking of miles, uh, commuting miles are non-deductible. This is one I often see confused. Going to work in the morning and coming back from work is not a deductible expense. Um, then now I'm talking about that being different from traveling outside of their tax home to go to like seminars or being assigned on like temporary workstation in another city and things like that. Those types of things are deductible under travel expenses. That's pub 463, travel entertainment, gift and car expenses. So there definitely is a provision for travel, but if they're just waking up in the morning and going to work and driving back, even if they drive several hours, that doesn't mean that it is deductible. It's commuting. It doesn't count. Um, that one oftentimes really irritates people, but it's the, but it's the law. Um, and finally, uh, I want to make sure to be wary of the ordinary and necessary rules to make sure that you're not deducting something that really shouldn't be deducted. And I mean, seriously, the IRS can ding you for not knowing better. Um, this is why, worst case scenario, have them sign off on stuff so that way, it, you know, on the, on the statement, so that way you have some sort of substantiation. If you have any objections, make them known. Um, you're not supposed to sign returns that you know contain bad information and because it speaks to your competency if you can't like 
basically justify uh, what you're putting on a tax return. Uh, that being said, some resources, IRS main site and Pub 17, uh, always top choices there. Pub 535 business expenses is where most of this came from. Pub 463, travel, entertainment, gift, and car expenses. Those do have separate rules like I've mentioned before. Vehicles especially have special rules connected to them. Uh, counting periods and methods, if you needed some refresher on those. Publication 583, starting a business and keeping records. Just a little hopeful guide to starting a business and actually beginning to keep records on it. And then uh, Publication 946, how to depreciate property. Depreciation is going to be its own topic. So I'm uh, going to have a webinar over it, but if you want to get a head start and don't know what I'm talking about, feel free to look through it. It's probably going to be a little bit difficult to process if, you, if you've never done it before, though. I'm going to go ahead and come to the question section. I do have a, a stack of these that are stuck in, um, in the section over here. I'm going to take about 30, 40 seconds to refresh my palate with a refreshing drink, and then I'll see what I can do about answering them. If you're in the audience and don't wish to sit around, we have hit our contact hour. You can uh, back out of the presentation now, and you, your credits will still be reported. And if that's the case, it was a pleasure having you. So give me a, a second, and then we'll go ahead and get on to answering some of these questions. Okay, coming back to it, uh, I see a question popping up here about net operating loss, uh, carried back, amending prior year's returns. Yes, if you do have an NOL and you do not make the election to bypass the carry back, you go back three years. Um, and when you do the 1040X, there actually is a separate checkbox beyond the, uh, in most software, in addition to just locking the form that says, I'm locking this and only doing a net operating loss, in which case it'll generate a plus or a minus um, in terms of tax liability or, you know, refund to the taxpayer, show what amount is uh, carried forward to subsequent years, and you go back three years, and then whatever's left over by the time that's done is going to get taken on into the future. Um, so, yes, you would have to amend it unless you make the election to bypass that uh, timely filed by the uh, due date of the initial return or by the extended date if they file an extension. Um, and talk about... Uh, example you gave, chairs delivered in January of next year, would it still be income in December when the offer was received? Depending upon their uh, accounting method, could be either. If they're a cash method accountant, um, then they're going to report the income as it's received or they have a fixed right to receive it. For the doctrine of constructive receipt, it's the same thing as like getting a check but not cashing it until January. You had the check, you had the right, you had income. Um, and if you're talking about accrual, then yes, the liability, the all events test is passed um, for your income reporting and for your expense reporting in connection to it. You've got a liability or income that's been actually generated. You, uh, you have that time frame set out in stone. It can definitely be assigned to you, determined to a reasonable accuracy. And in, in the case of uh, whether or not it would be income, typically economic performance would need to be the next thing associated with it. Um, and the economic performance in this case would be the production. So yes, it would be considered uh, income to them in December because they received the order. Even if they haven't delivered them and gotten paid, they have determined that they're going to get paid for it and that they are in the process of making them so that economic activity has begun, income in that year, and any of the expenses associated with it also would be expenses for that particular year and that time frame because they have, once again, passed all those tests. Taking a look at, uh, taking a look at some of the other questions, it looks like most of them actually already been answered. If you have any other questions, feel free to shoot them over, uh, webinar at federaldirecttax.com. I'm going to go ahead and conclude the presentation. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Uh, remember, back your mind, ordinary and necessary. Those are the two big questions you got to answer. If you do that and it's justifiable, 
uh, then you're probably good at putting it on there. And if you have questions over a particular return, please feel free to give us a call during our normal business hours, Monday to Friday, uh, 9 to 6 o'clock Eastern Standard. And Saturdays, we will start doing towards the beginning of tax season. Once tax season hits, we'll be in here 9 to 9 Eastern Standard, Monday to Friday, Saturday from 10 to 6. All right. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. If you guys need anything, feel free to, feel free to shoot your questions over here.